Welcome to Wednesday Q&A, where you all ask the questions and we answer. I am joined, as always, by my amazing, gorgeous co-host, physical therapist, lit sister-in-arms, Kristen Williams. Yay! So fun. We just got back from our big European tour, so we are feeling extra lit up and extra sisterly. Yes, I know. I miss you already. I, I, I miss how we were, we were like lying on the bed for our last one. It was so cute. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but you were like next to me. So it was I, now I can see you. So I guess there's advantages, but I'd always rather have you nearby. I know. It big was hugs. amazing. Yeah. Big hugs. Yeah. All right. So I am going to get us started here. We got a great question from our dear friend T Bob. And he says, uh, there is a popular yoga teacher who will remain nameless because I'm not shady, who preaches about how carrying angle of the forearm means that most people need to place their hands wider on the mat, thus wider than their shoulders in poses like down dog and plank. My logic is telling me this. Yes, when the arm is anatomical neutral carrying angle makes the hands wider than the shoulders. Uh, but when the forearm pronates like it does when we put the palms on the mat, does that mostly erase the carrying angle so that we should still align wrists under shoulders generally? What are your thoughts? I'm going to let you start on this one. Yeah, I mean, I think he, he says it exactly right. When you pronate, you are going to bring the shoulder more aligned over the wrist. Now, it's not like it's a finite point. It, there's To me, I think of it as a spectrum. So sometimes you can really go to the outer edge of that spectrum, like in terms of the outer alignment of the shoulder. But I don't. I think to teach everyone that a carrying angle makes this necessary is 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 not looking at the you know real anatomy of most people. I in all the years, and I'm sure you you have a lot to say about it too. I haven't seen many people. I mean, literally maybe half a dozen out of thousands of people that have an, an excessive carrying angle such that they really do need that because um, it might help them. What I find they often need more than even the hands wider is to purposefully have a little bit of an elbow bend because the hands wider isn't going to change that carrying angle. And in fact, it could actually make it um, more more prone for uh, pressure on the inner elbow um, if you have your hands wider and you're already talking about that increased curve of the carrying angle. So anybody that's listening, the carrying angle is the natural angle that is present between the elbow, shoulder, elbow, and wrist, the, that angle there, so that when you're walking, your arms don't slap your legs, you know. So it's naturally wider for women because we have wider hips because we give birth to babies. And so that's a little bit wide, wider than a male's. But it's still, for most women, is not excessive to the point that they actually have to do something about it in weight bearing. Where people, again, what I have seen predominantly is people spin their forearms and that increases that um, angle because they've spun it out of his, like from his point, out of that pronation, they're spinning it more like they're supinating, but they're still weight bearing. And that pushes into that um, position of the angle that could make it more susceptible to feeling some kind of strain. So I would say that if that person, the teacher is, is making that position, um, just like so many people do, I think it's like she's she or he is talking to a very small population, and you really cannot generalize for that. It's not going to be helpful to generalize for that. We see this all the time, especially on social media, like making blanket statements that uh, really are not generally correct for the biomechanics of most people. It, it might be helpful for a few people, so you can always say, like, to be determined, but... Um, I would argue that if you have good scapula stability and good weight bearing mechanics through that radial carpal joint and working the triceps uh, in a way that are that they are supporting the humeral head to not pitch forward or, or um, you know take the scapula out of it, I don't think you need to I don't think you need to widen your hands. I love that you pointed out the bend of the elbows. like it doesn't need to be 
in relation to the hands whatsoever. I, I personally, in my plank and down dog and down dog on the wall, I like my hands a little wider. They're still under my shoulders. I tend to kind of line my middle finger up with the outside of my shoulder. So I'm still really my weight bearing, my radiocarpal joint is under the shoulder, whereas the, um, you know, ulnocarpal joint is, is a little offset. Um, but especially someone like you said, with a wider carrying angle, and we don't see much of that. We see more of the hyperextensive elbow that can, in my opinion, mimic a look of a wider carrying angle because they, like you said, they spin that forearm and it creates that shape of a wide carrying angle in a weight bearing position. Just like we don't want people locking out their knees, we don't want people locking out their, their elbows. So a straight, in many cases, needs to be soft elbow for people in a weight bearing position which will allow them to set their hands up under the shoulders, not wide, and will actually encourage them, like you said, to get that exchange of energy, you know, to utilize more muscular strength than passive restraint. I mean, the elbows, especially for a hyperextensive person, really, it is so interesting. They really get the, the heck beat out of them in, in yoga, let's be honest, with people who slam them straight. And it is very interesting and intriguing to ask someone who's hyper mobile, whether it's in the knees or the elbows, to get a straight elbow, they are wobbling all over the place because what's that doing? That's not allowing them to settle into their passive restraint and forcing them to use their proprioception, their muscular strength those proximal muscles, especially at the scapula, to stabilize. So I agree with you, just like in physical therapy, we don't like when we see physical therapists giving cookie cutter exercises for a, a certain, oh, you have a rotator cuff, here's your handout of six exercises that I give to everybody. That is really not the best way to handle a client. You want to look at each individual person, set them up. But I would argue most people should still be lining their wrists in some way, shape, or form up under their shoulder, looking at the scapula, bend, you know, softening the elbow to keep a straight arm, not spinning in the forearm, and really see how that changes, aka increases the demand on the body in a good way. You know, we don't want our yoga practice to be passive. I always have said to, to my kids, whenever they do something, like, if you're going to do it, do it. You know, and that's what I used to say. If you're going to come to my yoga class, well, then do yoga. Don't uh, slap and flop. And, you know, like, what's the point? You know, let's, I, I love to turn my practice into a therapeutic session each and every time for my body. That is why we say, does your yoga make you feel 10 or 15 years younger? It does if you practice with strength. It mm -hmm. does not if you practice with passive hanging. So yeah, uh, and the, the other thing about. I just, yeah, the other thing I was thinking about too is that um, we saw this so much in Europe. I mean, we, a lot of people practice with us, some don't. And over and over people would say, oh, I've been trained to broaden my shoulders, broaden my scapula, you know, do, do the protracted thing, which I think actually widen your hands is probably going to encourage you to do that more. We, when we see the hypermobile people trying to like get their shoulders over their wrist with integrity and working their core, their scap, not only their arms shaking, their scapula muscle, their scapula are popping up. That, and I always say, that doesn't bother me. It's just showing us how much they need those um, underlying scapula muscles to pull the scapula closer to the back body. But if you are using, if you're having your hands wider, you're gonna probably try and get your chest involved and protract the scapula, which we actually really need neutral scapula, especially for lowering from plank or from changing from plank into side plank or anything like that. It's gonna be much more um, cohesive and integrated, you know, so, I think, again, just look at all the different parts that contribute to exchange of energy. And if you are keeping your forearms aligned and not spinning, if you're keeping your scapula neutral, you're probably better off having the wrist somewhere under the shoulder. And like you said, it could be the radiocarpal joint is right on the outer 
outer um, rim. It's not, again, a specific point, but a, a, a spectrum. Oh, great question. Okay, next question I have is from Summer Gal 10,000 Ts. She says, um, I really struggle with transition from quadruped to half kneel and can't spend much time in any kneeling posture. Any tips or transitions through quadruped or to help them spend more time in a healthy and supported way on their knees? I think she's actually talking about her students. We use double mats and blankets under the knees as much as possible, but the limitations remain. Thank you so much for the work you do and all that you share. It's such an inspiration. So I think the question is she has um, clients, students, who struggle with being in quadruped and this or any kind of kneeling posture. What are the tips? So you're already using double mats and blankets under the knees. Um, I'll just say a little bit, and I know you have a lot more to say as well because you work with uh, lots of clients, whether it's a knee replacement or older clients who have just not been on their knees. Because what happens, I think, is we, once we become upright, we don't tend to spend a lot of time down unless you're doing some laboring work, right? People that are scrubbing the floors or are in the garden or doing something that gets them in those range of motions. Most of us barely get on the ground unless we're doing little yoga. Um, and so one I think is there is maybe a little bit of uh, a hypervigilance that people have in their nervous system, in their thought about being on the ground, being on their knees, this isn't good for me. Um, and believe it or not, that can already set you up for feeling uncomfortable, feeling sensitivity on the knees. They might feel, they might feel sensitive because you haven't been on them. Mm -hmm. um, but putting double mats or blankets might be helpful. Uh, I'm going to tell you my opinion. I know KB is going to have, you know, not that it's my opinion. I, I think it's fine to put stuff on your knees. I'm more interested in what else you could do to, do, to help that. Because all that's doing is kind of cushioning the sensitivity. And maybe it's that we need to look up the chain and like what's happening in the hip or down the chain, what's happening in the ankle. Because if your hip cannot maintain its neutral stance and get into like at least zero, you know, um, going toward an extension, then that's going to drive the pressure down into your knee. We see this with anterior tilted people all the time. They feel it in their knees. They feel it in their knees. So I would rather get them on maybe a block under their knee and really signal them to lift out of the knee. Anytime I, I, I have this class called the feline effect on the lit, on lit daily, and it's like we want to be like cats, like light landing. We're not going into anything on the ground and just sinking into it. We want to have that energy come back up. So I would recommend un, you know, really uncovering the why they're uncomfortable in their knees, like ask them questions. Is it sharp pain? Is it feel pressure? Uh, you know, and then look at the alignment. Are, is their pelvis neutral? And, and then you know, tease out some of this stuff. If they, if they only feel comfortable having something on their knee, I wouldn't take it away, but work on hip mobility for sure. KB? Yeah, no, I love that you brought that up because um, I, there are there are a population of people that that, for example, the knee replacement. Um, it's not that you shouldn't shouldn't weight bear through your knees after knee replacement. It just doesn't feel good to them. I mean, they they have decreased sensation, they have abnormal sensation, so they feel less steady. Um, but there's no contraindication to weight bearing through the knee after any type of knee surgery, um, people who have really bad arthritis in the patellofemoral joint, that might not feel great. Um, however, I love that you made this point, you know, a lot of times people are sinking into the knee as opposed to lifting up out. And it's, I agree with you, Laura, coming from the hip, uh, coming from the pelvis, if they are, if you're so tight, it's coming from the soft tissue structures on the anterior side. You know, we do put a lot of focus on the posterior chain, posterior chain, posterior chain being weak. And a lot of times having a lot of restrictions in areas of the posterior chain. But we see this on the anterior side too, where people are really tight in the front of the hip. So what, what's that going to do? That's going to pull on the anterior side of the knee. And then when we get them into a low lunge and let's say they flip their toes under, then we're 
you know, if we have some tightness in, in the bottom half, you know, the, the uh, shin side, or even in the gastroc, excuse me, yeah, the gastrocnemius, that can also shift weight into the knee. So a lot of times it's not a knee issue. It is a hip, pelvis, foot and ankle issue that's driving into the knee. So, can, and a core strength issue. Can we, can we help people learn how to lift up and be light? You know, where you're not sinking in is the pelvis level, you know, or are you using the strength of the core to, to be light through that knee? And then what I found personally with my own knees, um, I am a, a runner. I'm not like a crazy runner like I used to be. I just run for exercise now, but usually the day I run, my patellofemoral uh, sensitivity increases and it's very temporary. And honestly, weight bearing helps it. When I get down and I sometimes feel like, ooh, hello, there you are. I'll actually find that spot and do a little self-massage. I will get on the knee and I will circle the knee on the ground to desensitize it to loosen it up because I think what I'm feeling, yes, is discomfort, but is it because of the weight bearing through uh, inflamed tissues? I'm not confident that's what it is. I think, because every time I will mobilize it around and then I'm totally fine. So, you know, what we're feeling is not always what is occurring. And so how can we take that pressure off? How can we, you know, adjust? It's like, you know, taking the skinny jeans off and putting the yoga pants on. How can we loosen up, you know, and not be pulling across that, that patella, especially if it, if it is worn down or if it is desensitized, desensitized from a surgery. And I also love that you said, if people need padding, that's okay. Start there but still be looking at their pelvis, still be looking at their foot and ankle mobility, still be looking at their strength and ability to lift up and then see, okay, can we take one level down? Can we then progress to kneeling? And they will be pleasantly surprised. I would guess probably eight times out of 10 that they are able to weight bear without a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And I love what you said about the core too, because we have to even look all the way up at like, where's the head position? You know, that's why posture matters because if you're, if you're like in a half kneel, which is essentially 90, 90, but your head is forward, it's summoning all that energy forward. And that could be directed into the bottom knee. It could be directed into the front pelvis. Um, so really thinking of pulling that energy up through the center of the pelvis, through the spine, all the way up into the cervical spine. And yeah, just, I, I often, I was just thinking um, with some athletes that have had a ton of that kind of tightness, getting like a, I use a, you could use a broomstick. I have like a little bamboo pole just so they can feel this sense of uprightness with the help of the, because sometimes they won't, they're just, they're focusing on, they're focusing on the down and that, how that doesn't feel great on the knee and, and giving them something to hold on to actually to pull up and feel how that can unweight the knee. And then their brain is like, oh, oh, that's how it's done. So every time they go into it, they're not like preemptively anticipating discomfort. I love that. Yeah, very good. Okay, one more question here. Um, Ash, one love Ash. I've been a yoga teacher since 2017 and an athlete my entire life. I had a tubing injury in 2012 and I do think that's impacted my SI joint. But I always had issues as a hockey player, but the nerve issues only got bad with yoga. I took time off during COVID and my nerve issues improved, so I knew yoga made it worse. Getting back in my practice now, I was more mindful in twists and bends, et cetera. But last week, I had a severe episode, and my osteopath told me my sacrum was rotated left. She did some work on it, and my pain is now 1 out of 10 instead of 10 out of 10. I couldn't sit, stand, or lie down without pain um, through my left left low back and glute. I listened to some of your podcast episodes on anatomy. I'm curious how I can better protect myself from this happening again and often. I think back bends are main trigger, but also deep forward folds and poses like half pigeon, extended side angle with a bind, and even single leg airplane pose, half moon on that side. In warrior series, should I keep wider stance and turn back toe more toward the front in, in warrior two, et cetera? I appreciate your insight. 
What a great oh, question. And, and then she said, oh, oh. and deep twist. Uh, so this is somebody who, um, Ash, first of all, thank you for writing us. Uh, I'm going to recommend going to our lit platform because a lot of the things you mentioned that are triggering, we don't actually even teach because of this exact reason, whether or not you have a pre-existing SI injury or not. And it's interesting how you took time off, it got better, and then yoga you know, started it up again. And this is what you know, Krista and I have both found. Kristen actually came to yoga after treating so many people in PT and wanted to know like, what's the deal in yoga that people are coming to me as a PT? Um, so I'll just briefly mention it and then I'll give it over to KB. So first of all, extended side angle with a bind, we really don't do. That's a very hard pose to do uh, well. And it's kind of like, I always look at cost benefit, the, the cost of getting that deep um, and adding a bind, it, it's just it's just not a great pose. And, and it's one of those poses that is practiced in, in, in a variety of different types of yoga. And I always want to know why. Why do people think that they should include this? Because it's, it, it's practically impossible to keep your pelvis in neutral um, to do this. Then you add a bind, and you're really putting a lot of stress on that bottom shoulder. And then where, you've got to kind of torque yourself. Where are you going to torque is in your SI joint, around your sacrum. So I would say um, we do a warrior variation, which is basically a modified extended side angle, much more powerful, much more control because your pelvis is neutral. You're continuing to hold on to your core. You're not going to create any of that torque that you would find that you're probably creating in that pose. We do do um, single leg airplane and half moon. And I bet if we were to look at you, I bet you're turning your pelvis in those poses um, because that's how a lot of people will teach it, like get that le leg as high as you can. And to get the leg as high as you can in a one-legged balance position, you're going to turn your pelvis. The bottom side of that pelvis is going to be compressed, um, similar to half moon. So we teach it differently. We really work on major strength in the poses, thinking about lengthening that top leg, not about how high it goes. So that is something when you do, and also in airplane, we almost always give you a hand on the thigh for a buttressing. That buttressing is for your spine so that when it comes down into the pelvis around the sacrum there, you have extra strength and support upwards, and it's not going to go down on one side and compress. And I'll let you talk about warrior two, but it, I would just say, Ash, just go and do our two-week free trial, because what you'll find is you'll find all the stuff that you love in yoga, because what it sounds like is I know you don't want to give it up, even though you found that it was the thing that's causing you pain, but it's going to get you stronger, and it's going to give you the why why you should do poses a certain way, what you should be thinking about, why you shouldn't be doing seated deep forward folds, which offer you really nothing. Honestly, they're just, uh, dare I say, garbage. <laughs> seated forward <laughs> folds. Like I, I'm saying, if you do them every once in a while, no big deal. But if you're doing them every class and you're holding it and you're trying to go as long, they, they are just they're just garbage. They're not doing anything for you. They aren't. And what you're doing is pulling on soft tissue structures. You need, I said this when we were in our workshops, you need stability before everything else to get mobility. You, you're not going to get mobility by sagging or by pushing into poses. So I would A, lay off any seated forward folds. Never feel like you have to do them. We don't, I, we don't do them. I don't miss them. I, they would, uh, and deep twist, do not use your arms when you're twisting. Use your core and don't ever like lever your arm to get more of a twist because then you're pushing into the structures like your sacrum, SI joint, and the ligaments around there and the disc. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you basically took a lot of the words out of my mouth. Um, as I like to call myself a, a re recovering um, osteopathic practitioner, I know exactly what you're talking about when you went to your osteopath and she said your pelvis was rotated and, and she did some sort of a technique to, to help put you back. That absolutely works. And it's interesting that, you know, the yoga was making it worse, especially the type of yoga, it sounds like you were practicing. Um, 
What we find is that people bring all the things they are doing off of the mat right onto the mat. So you probably also have some bad, I don't say bad, but poor habits uh, with the way you're sitting or, or just um, a lack of stability, you know, core pelvic stability, which most people do. You are not alone. Um, I would say the majority of people, we are weaker in our proximal musculature right around the SI joint. And so people who are presenting with, in my experience, people who present with SI joint dysfunction, I always discover hip and core weakness. The SI joint is a stable joint. It is a tongue and groove joint that is meant to transmit force you know, as we walk through this stable pelvis, when it is getting cranked, it is because the muscles of the pelvis, the deep core, the hips are not doing their job. So it doesn't surprise me that the airplane, and even if a, a, a lit bent knee buttressed airplane could be problematic for someone who is really weak in their glutes in their rotators, in their stabilizers, um, which I would suspect you are. And then you go to a traditional yoga class that doesn't focus on any of that and really has you once again, sinking in to what you're most likely already doing in your daily living. I do it. I, I, I cross one leg more than the other. I try to, I, I'm purposely making changes off the mat that I discover on the mat in my practice. And so I agree with Laura, get on the lit platform, start slow, even though you might, you sound like you're an athlete, you sound like you really love athletics, but what we love to see for you to do is to start sm slow in our, maybe like our beginner launch pad, where we introduce you to all of these principles that we believe in, but we start slow, 15 minutes. And you can really, focus on making these little tweaks to your practice where now your yoga becomes your therapy. It becomes where you learn good habits and where you dismiss and get rid of bad postural habits. It will, I promise you, change your life. I have seen it in my own clients who have started with me on the treatment table with the reset. We do it there. We begin in a beginner, even though they're athletes, we begin in a beginner lit, and now they are pain-free, strong in their core, no more SI joint pain. They didn't understand, why are you having me work my hips uh, when it's my back? You know, why am I not stretching? And you don't need to stretch. You need to strengthen and stabilize. And lit yoga is the best thing out there for that. I firmly believe that otherwise I wouldn't be working here and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing on the platform because like Laura said, I was the PT that came and said, what in the heck are people <laughs> doing in yoga? And I was literally two classes in, oh, oh goodness gracious. The, all the things you're talking about, the forward fold, the triangle pose, you know, the deep triangle, all the binds. I used to do them because it's an ego. It's an ego. Can I do it? Yes, I can. And then started to kind of wake up in my own smart, you know, intelligence and be like, why am I doing this? You know, it's not about strength. It's about ego. And so where we're going to challenge you is going to be ego on strength. You know, you're going to be like, holy crap, you're pouring with sweat. You're really going to feel weak. Don't let that deter you. Let that empower you to improve and to really make a change in your body for better, for longer, for a more sustainable life that is free of pain because you can absolutely be free of pain. Absolutely, amen. And I might add, um, KB has a sciatica series which deals with all this is very related to weaker glutes, weaker um, abdominal core, low back core that has an impact. It can either impact in the form of sciatica or in the form of SI just SI joint dysfunction, but we, my postnatal is amazing whether or not you had a baby or not, because it's about organizing the pelvis and the structures around it and the stability around it. And I've had many people with SI joint um, pain who have loved it. So check those out as well on Lit Daily. And stop just putting your face on your thighs and a seated forward fold. <laughs> 
All right, everybody, we love you. Ask the questions. We will answer. We're giving you our opinions. It comes from it's collectively over 50 years of experience, um, but we're always learning too. So, you know, take what we say and try it for yourself. Be a critical thinker. And that's really um, what we want to just invite everyone to do, um, no matter no matter what kind of yoga you're practicing, is be a critical thinker and do what's best for you. Absolutely. All right, I love that's you. why we invite you to ask us questions, because you yeah. can challenge us. Exactly. Show us those critical thinking skills. You can write us at support at lityoga.com. You can find us on Instagram. I'm at kbwilliams99 and Laura. I'm at laura.hyman. So direct message us. That's a great way to get in touch with us or write us at support at lityoga.com. And know that, as always, we are pulling for you.